Committee on Space and Aeronautics will come to order. Uh, without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the subcommittee at any time. Uh, welcome to today's hearing entitled Returning to the Moon, Keeping Artemis on Track. And before I uh, make them all for my opening statement, I would like to acknowledge that I appreciate our witnesses being here today. Mother Nature is proving to be somewhat challenging this week, as you can see by the turnout of membership. This uh, has been a hearing that's been much anticipated by the members in a very enthusiastic way, but you have to physically get here. Uh, and that's a challenge we're working in. And subcommittee Chairman Babin is in the air somewhere between here and Houston. So the moment he arrives, uh, we'll have a proper chairman to preside over this process. With that, I want to recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. Good morning, and I welcome everyone to the Science Committee's uh, first hearing of 2024. It's fitting that we're kicking off the year with a hearing on Artemis, given its importance to our space program and to U.S. competitiveness. My top priority since becoming chairman of the Science Committee has been to ensure that American competitiveness and leadership in the fields of research and technology development. This includes U.S. activities in space, especially human exploration. The importance of U.S. leadership in space is why some of our top legislative priorities as Congress include a NASA reauthorization bill, which we'll consider this spring, and the Commercial Space Act. It has been almost seven years since a comprehensive NASA authorization bill was signed into law, and that's simply too long for an agency of NASA's importance. Much has happened during that period, and this committee should provide direction to NASA's activities for the coming years, especially in the areas of human exploration. How we address future human exploration beyond low Earth orbit is undoubtedly a topic we'll address in the NASA authorization bill. Artemis is a cornerstone of that effort. I'm confident that I speak for everyone on this committee when I say we all support Artemis. This committee has long directed NASA to return humans to the moon and eventually Mars. But this committee's support of Artemis means asking detailed questions of NASA and providing oversight of the agency's proposals. Congress must have proper insight in the agency's planning and execution of this mission to ensure its success. This also means listening to inputs from external stakeholders and hearing differing viewpoints, which is why we've assembled a panel of witnesses with a variety of perspectives today. Last week, NASA announced the delay of Artemis II to September 2025 and Artemis III to September 2026. I look forward to hearing from NASA about the cause of these delays and potential impacts to future missions and about the steps it is taking to mitigate future risks. We have a responsibility to not only our constituents but the international community to see that Artemis is executed in a timely and physically responsible manner without sacrificing safety. I remind my colleagues that we are not the only country interested in sending humans to the moon. The Chinese Communist Party is actively solicitating international partners for a lunar mission, a lunar research station, and has stated its ambition to have astronauts on, uh, human astronauts on the surface by 2030. The country that lands first will have the ability to set a precedent for whether future lunar activities are conducted with openness and transparency or in a more restricted manner. I'm grateful to our panel for appearing before us today to share their experience and expertise, and I look forward to a productive discussion on how we can ensure the success of Artemis and the best way for the U.S. to be the world leader in human space exploration. I now recognize Ranking Member Sorensen for his opening statement. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman Lucas, uh, for holding today's hearing, uh, Returning to the Moon, Keeping Artemis on Track. Uh, I want to welcome our distinguished witnesses. Uh, thank you for your time and your expertise and for being here today. Um, I was not alive uh, huddled around the TV for Apollo 11, um, but my parents watched that landing. Um, I'm the son of an aerospace engineer and a meteorologist uh, with a deep love of, of science. I know the profound impact it has had on our country and on our world. Uh, when I look up in the night sky, I. I, I wonder what's up there. I want us to know what's up there. Today we're examining NASA's Artemis mission. Uh, the program, separated into several stages, is designed to bring humans step by step to the moon and beyond. Artemis will inspire the next generation strengthen our aerospace industry and international partnerships, and demonstrate capabilities needed to eventually send humans to Mars. 
Last year, I was proud to host NASA astronaut Dr. Kate Rubens in my district in Western Illinois. Dr. Rubens spoke about her excitement uh, for the upcoming generation. She believes that, uh, and I spoke with our witnesses earlier, that the first humans that will set foot on Mars may be in a first grade classroom today. What an exciting possibility for the next generation, for our children. The Artemis I mission was an important first uncrewed test that sent the Orion vehicle thousands of miles beyond the moon before its return to Earth. Artemis II will test additional systems as it brings humans around the moon. And Artemis III will land humans back on the lunar surface. The difficulty of these missions cannot be underestimated. Last week, we learned that NASA is delaying the Artemis II and three missions by about a year. I stand behind NASA in prioritizing safety for Artemis, and I look forward to gaining further insight into the delays and any related costs. Artemis requires a sustained national investment. In a 2021 report, the NASA Office of the Inspector General said, quote, NASA is projected to spend $93 billion on the Artemis effort from fiscal year 2012 to 2025, end quote. And that's even before we land our astronauts on the moon. As authorizers with oversight responsibility, this committee needs to ensure that those investments are made wisely. This hearing provides a timely opportunity to get both an update on the progress and an understanding of the pressing issues of the Artemis program, including does NASA and Congress have an appropriate level of understanding of the cost of key Artemis systems, individual Artemis missions, and a sustained lunar exploration effort? What is the critical path for returning humans to the moon, and what is the plan for addressing all of the challenges? How would a fiscal 2024 budget at enacted 2023 levels, or even a cut below the 2023 levels, affect this program? How are NASA and its partners addressing risks, and how will risk be communicated to the American people? In closing, Mr. Chairman, I want Artemis to be safe and successful. Artemis and Moon to Mars are tremendous opportunities and of importance to the United States and the rest of the world. America's international leadership and engagement in the Artemis program and the Artemis Accords will promote peaceful, safe, and sustainable exploration of the moon and other celestial bodies. Thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time, Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Sorensen. I now recognize the ranking member of the full committee for a statement. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for holding today's hearing. I want to welcome our witnesses, and thank you for being here to discuss the topic of returning to the moon, keeping Artemis on track. This committee, as the chairman has noted, has long maintained its bipartisan support for Artemis uh, and the NASA's moon to Mars efforts, and I don't see that changing in any way. I was thrilled with the success of the Artemis One test flight. In my own state of California, NASA's Moon to Mars campaign supports 11,600 jobs and created an economic impact of $2.8 billion, according to NASA's 2021 Economic Impact Report. So let me be clear, I support Artemis, but I want it to be successful, especially with China at our heels. And we need, we want to be helpful here in the committee in ensuring that Artemis is strong and staying on track as we look to lead the world hand in hand with our partners in the human exploration of the moon and beyond. Now sending people into space, let alone the moon, isn't easy. And NASA recently announced delays to the Artemis II and III missions. I have confidence in NASA's workforce and the decision to keep safety as a top priority. To that end, I look forward to understanding the details behind the recent delays and what's involved in addressing those issues. As the Artemis efforts continue, we as the authorized committee must have our eyes wide open. Moon to Mars is a multi-decadal decadal effect effort that will span several Congresses and administrations. Full situational awareness requires that one, we know how much the key Artemis systems cost as well as the missions themselves. Two, 
have a realistic understanding of how NASA is assessing schedule, and three, have clarity on the top most technical challenges and risks and how they're being addressed across NASA and among its diverse set of partners and acquisition mechanisms. We also know NASA has a lot on its plate. The future of low Earth orbit and the planned end of the uh, International Space Station operations in 2030, the need for critical yet costly deorbit vehicle, uh, the transition to the use of future commercial space stations and their readiness to come online, all this has to be kept in mind. In addition, key considerations on the Mars sample return are on the horizon, and as we learned last week from NASA and NOAA's annual assessment of global temperature, we must continue to obtain the measurements and observations needed to understand and mitigate the impacts of climate crisis. In short, NASA is a multi-mission agency, and we can't lose sight of the benefits and challenged of, uh, challenges of a balanced a portfolio, but supporting balance won't be made any easier by the uh, dysfunctional appropriations process that I think threatens to undermine what we know is best for, the, for leading the world and growing our economy in a sustainable way, investments in R&D and innovations such as those at NASA. I'm excited about Artemis and Moon to Mars, and I look forward to working with our chairman, with the administration, and with stakeholders on building a smart, strong, and sustainable path forward. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. Uh, chair would note that uh, when subcommittee chairman Babin arrives, we'll uh, make his uh, time for an opening statement, too. Let me introduce our witnesses. Our first witness today is Catherine Kerner, Associate Administrator for the Exploration Systems Development Mission Directorate of NASA. Her responsibilities include the development of the Moon to Mars infrastructure, management of systems development for Artemis, and planning NASA's deep space exploration approach. Ms. Kerner previously served as the Deputy Associate Administrator for the Directorate, and prior to that served as the Orion Program Manager. Our next witness is Mr. William Russell, Director of Contracting and National Security Acquisitions at GAO. He manages a portfolio which includes issues related to NASA and DOD's industrial base and supply chain integrity, among other topics. Mr. Russell joined GAO in 2002 and has previously served on GAO's Homeland Security and Justice team. Our third witness is Mr. George Scott, Acting Inspector General at NASA. He assumed the role in January of this year, having previously served as the Deputy Inspector General. Prior to joining NASA, Mr. Scott served over three decades at GAO, which included serving as the Managing Director of GAO's Homeland Security and Justice Team. Our final witness is Dr. Michael Griffin, co-president of LogiQ, a scientific and technical consulting firm he co-founded. Dr. Griffin previously served as the 11th Administrator of NASA, leading the agency from 2005 to 2009. He has also served as the Under Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, as well as the Space Department Head at the John Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory. Again, thank you all for being here today, and I now recognize uh, Ms. Kerner for five minutes to present her testimony. Chairman Lucas, Ranking Member Sorensen, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on NASA's Artemis campaign. Under the Artemis campaign, the United States, along with our international and commercial partners, will return humans to the moon to explore, conduct scientific research, and establish the capability for a long-term human presence on and around the moon. Then, using what we learn at the moon, we will take the next giant leap, sending the first humans to Mars. In November 2022, NASA took the first major step in America's return to the moon with the Artemis One mission. That historic launch and 25 and a half day mission tested the space launch system rocket, the Orion spacecraft, and the exploration ground systems in preparation for Artemis II. On Artemis II, NASA astronauts Reed Weissman, Victor Glover, Christina Cook, and Canadian astronaut Jeremy Hansen will journey beyond low Earth orbit and around the moon, the farthest humans have journeyed into space in more than 50 years. Approximately one year after Artemis II, the Artemis III crew will land on the lunar south pole and begin building out a robust long-term exploration program. With Artemis IV, astronauts will again visit the lunar surface and start assembly of the space station in lunar orbit called Gateway. 
NASA's plan for a successful and sustainable return to the moon requires the development of several new space systems, including the SLS rocket, the Orion spacecraft, the exploration ground systems, lunar landers, the Gateway Space Station, and new lunar spacesuits and lunar rovers. Last year, pursuant to the NASA Authorization Act of 2022, NASA established the Moon to Mars Program Office, which focuses on the development of these new systems, mission integration, and risk man management across the portfolio. This new office also leads planning and analysis for long lead technology developments to support humans to Mars. In the years since NASA's successful Artemis I flight test, NASA has continued to refine the schedule of the follow-on Artemis missions. Based on data from Artemis I and the readiness of the space systems needed to safely transport our crews from Earth to the lunar surface and back, the Artemis II adds several new systems to support astronauts inside of Orion. In addition, we are continuing to study the Orion heat shield from Artemis I to ensure the safety of our crew on future missions. Based on these factors, we're planning for Artemis II to launch in September of 2025, Artemis III will build on the progress of Artemis I and II and adds a commercial lunar lander and advanced spacesuits for walking on the lunar surface. In 2026, Artemis III will send humans back to the surface of the moon. While sending humans back to the moon will be a significant accomplishment, we do not intend to stop there. NASA's long-term goal is to send humans to Mars, and the moon will help us get there. Mars is a rich destination for scientific discovery and a driver of technologies that will, will enable humans to travel and explore far from Earth. By using what we learn on and around the moon under Artemis, NASA is working to understand and overcome the future challenges associated with landing and living on Mars. As NASA builds a blueprint for human exploration throughout the solar system for the benefit of humanity, we conducted our first two architecture concept reviews, the culmination of a robust analysis process designed to align NASA's Moon to Mars exploration strategy and codify the supporting architecture. This annual review is a milestone that enables our Moon to Mars strategy to evolve over time as we consider lessons from previous missions and provide opportunities to on-ramp new technologies as well as new industry and international partners. Through the Artemis campaign, NASA is partnering with the most diverse and broad exploration coalition in history, including multiple international and commercial partners. For example, NASA's Gateway Program is an international collaboration with the Canadian Space Agency, European Space Agency, Japan Exploration Agency, and now the United Arab Emirates Mohab bin Rashad Space Center to establish humanity's first space station around the moon. Similarly, NASA is exploring additional international partnerships for lunar surface habitats, logistics, and mobility capabilities that will enable long-term hu human presence and enhance scientific returns. Together, we will continue to develop the technology and the systems needed to live and work on and around the moon in preparation for human missions to Mars. Because of our diverse astronaut corps, we will be able to fly the first woman, first person of color, and the first international astronaut to the moon. We will align with our international partners towards a future of expand, expanded economic opportunity and scientific discovery while investing in the next generation of STEM leaders as we support the <coughs> limitless possibilities of space exploration. NASA is grateful for this committee's continued support of the Artemis campaign, and I appreciate this opportunity to update you on behalf of NASA and our Ar Artemis partners and we'll be pleased to answer your questions. Thank you very much. I now recognize Mr. Russell for five minutes to present his testimony. Chairman Lucas, Ranking Member Lofgren, Ranking Member Sorensen, members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss NASA's efforts to return astronauts to the surface of the moon and ultimately human exploration of Mars through the Artemis missions. NASA has requested at least $38 billion over the next five years to support this ambitious undertaking. The projects supporting Artemis are complex and specialized and often push the state of the art in space technology. These new projects include a human landing system to transport crew to the lunar surface and spacesuits for lunar operations. In addition, NASA plans to rely on existing programs, including the Orion multipurpose crew vehicle and the space launch system. Successfully executing the Artemis missions will require extensive coordination across programs and with a wide range of contractors to ensure systems operate together seamlessly and safely. Our work has highlighted NASA's progress towards its Artemis flight tests and lunar landing mission, 
Examples include the successful launch of Artemis One in November 2022, which demonstrated the initial capability of the space launch system, as well as the exploration ground systems. For Artemis II, the first flight with crew, NASA is currently conducting integration and testing of the crew capsule and the launch pad. And for Artemis III, the first crewed lunar landing mission, the HLS contractor has conducted two test flights. NASA also continues to make progress on its integration and risk management plans, such as establishing mechanisms for identifying and tracking Artemis III risks and the establishment and implementation of the Moon to Mars program office. While NASA continues to develop capabilities needed to support Artemis efforts, the agency does face several challenges. These include the Artemis schedule, a lack of transparency into the Artemis mission and program costs, and other acquisition management challenges. In terms of Artemis III schedule, in our November 2023 report, we found that there were a variety of factors that made the previous December 2025 date unlikely. These included an ambitious schedule delays to key events, and the remaining technical work. Specifically, we found that if the HLS development took as many months to complete as an average NASA project, it was likely, Artemis III would be likely to occur in early 2027. Just last week, NASA adjusted the launch date to September 2026 to allow contractors more time to complete a significant amount of remaining technical work. In terms of Artemis III mission costs in December 2019, we found that NASA didn't plan to establish an official cost estimate for this mission. We made a recommendation and NASA concurred with it to establish one, but has not yet done so. While NASA requested $6.8 billion to support Artemis III programs in the fiscal year 2024 budget request, decision makers will have limited knowledge into the full scope of the Artemis III mission costs until an estimate is created. Last, in terms of acquisition management, NASA has been on GAO's high risk list for a number of years related to acquisition management and has made a lot of progress there. But NASA's largest, most complex projects, including those that support the Artemis missions, continue to shape the agency's entire acquisition portfolio. When these projects ex exceed their cost or schedule baselines, it can have cascading effects on other projects and efforts. In our 23 assessment of NASA projects, we found that NASA anticipated setting baselines for six Artemis programs, including HLS. As these projects enter the portfolio, they will drive the agency's acquisition performance over the next several years, for good or ill. In summary, NASA has made important progress on its Artemis efforts, but challenges remain. NASA will need to manage multiple risks seamlessly. It will need to continue to find ways to elevate risks across programs and mitigate those. That includes increasing transparency on how much Artemis III and future Artemis missions are likely to cost. Implementing our past recommendations will help NASA to improve in these critical areas. Chairman Lucas, this completes my prepared remarks. Look forward to any questions the subcommittee may have. Thank you. I now recognize Mr. Scott for five minutes to present his testimony. Good morning. Chairman Lucas, Ranking Member Lofgren, Ranking Member Sorensen, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me here today to discuss key challenges facing NASA's Artemis campaign. At the outset, I would like to thank the subcommittee for your continued support of our oversight work. Also, I would like to thank Paul Martin, our former Inspector General, for his exceptional leadership of our office over the past 14 years. It was a pleasure serving as his deputy for the last five and a half years. Historically, NASA has struggled to establish credible cost and schedule estimates, and Artemis is no exception. After more than a decade of preparation and delays, NASA successfully completed the Artemis I mission in December of 2022. Despite this achievement, NASA faces additional challenges to meeting its Artemis goals. Of utmost importance is resolving technical issues that could threaten astronaut safety. The agency will need to do this while also addressing long-standing concerns, such as unsustainable costs, unreliable project schedules, and the lack of transparency into funding needs. In terms of technical challenges, NASA's most immediate issue is preparing for the Artemis II mission, the first crew test flight of SLS and Orion. For example, the Artemis I flight revealed unexpected erosion of protective material on Orion's heat shield. In addition, 
the agency has identified other issues with Orion that it needs to correct before the next launch. Recognizing the challenges that lie ahead, last week NASA announced delays to the next two Artemis missions. This will allow more time to address technical issues identified during the first mission, as well as support further development and testing of other systems, including the human landing system and next generation spacesuits. The second challenge is the campaign's enormous cost. Overall, we projected that total Artemis cost will reach $93 billion between 2012 and 2025. We also estimate that SLS and Orion production and operating costs will total at least $4.2 billion per launch for the first four Artemis missions. This figure does not include $42 billion in formulation and development costs spent over the past dozen years. Given these costs, it is imperative that NASA identify and effectively, effectively implement cost-saving measures. To its credit, the agency recognizes the need to reduce costs and is attempting to do so. Our work, however, has found that some key cost reduction efforts may fall short. This is due in part to NASA not capturing certain costs when developing estimates or relying on unrealistic assumptions. NASA also wants to make its moon to Mars effort more sustainable by sharing costs with its international partners. However, the agency current plans, the agency's current plan does not include cost estimates for these partners beyond Artemis IV. Finally, the Artemis campaign lacks cost and schedule transparency. NASA has not developed a comprehensive estimate for all Artemis costs, and unlike its other major projects and programs, NASA has not established life cycle costs or made cost and schedule commitments for some programs supporting Artemis. Without the agency fully accounting for and accurately reporting the overall cost of current and future missions, it will be difficult for Congress to make informed decisions about NASA's long-term funding needs. Further, without credible, complete, and transparent cost and schedule estimates, NASA will be hard pressed to achieve meaningful cost savings, a key step to making Artemis truly sustainable over time. We look forward to assisting NASA in achieving its Artemis goals and will continue to provide independent, objective, and comprehensive oversight of this effort. Thank you. Thank you. I now would like to recognize Dr. Griffin for five minutes to uh, present his testimony. Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Sorensen Lofgren, members of the committee, thanks for the invitation to appear here today. Um, I will try to use less than my five minutes and I will be direct. Um, in my judgment, the Artemis program is excessively complex, unrealistically priced, compromises crew safety, poses very high mission risk of completion, and is highly unlikely to be completed in a timely manner, even if successful. Um, this matters because our self-declared adversary, adversaries, the Chinese Communist Party, together with their Russian partner, um, fully understand the role that, that being on the space frontier has in the world of global power politics. We seem no longer to understand that. For the United States and its partners not to be on the moon when others are on the moon is unacceptable. We need a program that is consistent with that theme. Artemis is not that program. We need to restart it, not keep it on track per the subject of this hearing. The Congress should provide specific direction to the executive branch to address this issue. Thank you. Uh, I would request my full statement, written statement, be entered into the record, and I will stand down for your questions. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, I turn to myself now for five minutes for questions. Um, Ms. Kerner, NASA announced last week that Artemis II is now targeted for launch in September 2025 and Artemis III targeted for launch in September 2026. Can you share the scheduling margin built into the updated Artemis two and three launches? So thank you, Chairman Lucas. Um, appreciate the question today. We are 
have adjusted the Artemis II schedule based on crew safety. As you recall, from coming out of Artemis I, we had a tremendously success, successful mission. And one of the follow-on investigations from that mission is the performance of the heat shield. That has taken us some time to analyze the data. The heat shield performed perfectly from a thermal perspective, but we saw some unusual characteristics, and we want to fully understand that before we put um, Reed, Victor, Christina, and Jeremy on Artemis II. So that has contributed to the delay in the mission. We have sufficient time to complete that investigation with the 10-month adjustment to that launch schedule. Also, with Artemis II, we have additional capabilities on the Orion spacecraft. The life support systems have proven to be more difficult and challenging to develop, and during the testing of some of those systems, we identified an issue with the digital motor controller that has impacted our ability to be able to continue the processing the vehicle as previously planned. The additional time that we have, gi have um, given ourselves in the adjusted schedule permits us the opportunity to address the challenges that we've seen with that digital motor controller. So we have a number of issues, and those issues are all encapsulated with this, this margin that we have on the schedule for the September 2025. There is margin built into that schedule for us to complete all of the necessary testing and to address all of the regular processing that we lessons learned that we had from the Artemis One launch. To the rest of the panel, based on these margins, do you believe that these revised schedule launches dates are realistic? Whoever care to touch that first. Yeah, Chairman Lucas, I can jump in. Um, I, I think for Artemis II, certainly that that provides more time to to get through the the issues and and uh, figure out the heat shield life support um, challenges that Ms. Kerner referenced. The the one thing that jumps out with the revised Artemis III date is the the span of time between Artemis II and three is is one year. So if you if you consider the successful conclusion of Artemis One in 2022, and now it's going to be a few years to the 25 date to do essentially uh, the same Artemis test flight, a second time with the crew. Artemis Three is more complicated, so there's not a lot of time. And as you saw with Artemis One, there are things that are going to happen that you need to learn, that you need to investigate. One year is not a lot of time to do that learning, turn around, and be ready for a a September uh, 2026 launch date. So that's that's the one schedule pressure that we see with the, the new dates. Any observations, gentlemen, that you'd care to add? I would say that the Artemis, uh, the, the Artemis circumlunar mission is, um, I think, very doable on the time scale that NASA has said. I don't think the Artemis III, the landing mission, is at all realistically scheduled. Thank you, Chairman Lucas. I think NASA will continue to be challenged on the schedule front, particularly with the Artemis III mission. You know, historically, uh, certain space flight missions, uh, in terms of going from contract to development, have taken you know eight and a half years. And with HLS, NASA was trying to do it in a much more condensed time frame. So I think, based on lessons learned from Artemis II, I think that the agency will be better positioned to come out with a more realistic launch date for Artemis III. Um, Mrs. Kerner. Can you share with the committee what milestones NASA uses to measure contractor performance on the human landing system and space suit contracts, and along with that, what the consequences are for contractors if they don't meet the milestones by the assigned deadline? Okay. So um, with regards to the, the contract milestones, we have a number of milestones that are significant for the Artemis III um, landing, ultimate crew landing. The first would be an uncrewed demo. That has to happen prior to the crewed landing. We are keeping track on um, SpaceX, our prime contractor for the human landing system. We're keeping track of their progress. If you recall, they've had a number of test flights. And they will actually conduct their next test flight here, um, likely in the, the February timeframe. And they have um, good schedule margin to support that launch. We are anticipating a number of launches in calendar year 24 by our SpaceX indus um, industry partners to support the development of not only the human landing system capability, but also their cryogenic fuel transfer capability, which is essential for us to be able to understand um, the process for 
refueling the human landing system prior to when we send our crews. So we have various milestones throughout their contract that enable us to be able to measure their performance. We also have recently made contract modifications that allow us to incentivize them to meet those milestones on the schedule that we need in order for us to support the launch date of, of, of the crew in September of 2026. I will note that we do parallel processing of a lot of our missions, so it's not like we have just one year between Artemis II and Artemis III to get everything accomplished. We are right now working on the hardware for Artemis III, and in particular, I will note, um, things like the European Service Module will be shipping here in the spring to the Kennedy Space Center for processing and to complete assembly of the Orion spacecraft. So I fully expect that before we ever launch Artemis II, Artemis III vehicle processing will be far enough along that we will be able to take advantage of the one year between the two missions to be able to fully be ready for the Artemis III mission in September of 26. I will also note that if you recall this, the um, press conference that we did just last week when we announced the slip to those launch dates, we had our 11 industry partners online with us for that, and all of them have signed up for the launch date of Artemis III that we are currently showing. Thank you. And before I yield to the ranking member, I would note that I've had several conversations with the administrator, and he has a great deal of confidence in you. I just want to pass that along. And <laughs> with you. that, I yield back and turn to the ranking member, Mr. Sorensen, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Kerner, um, we have heard from GAO and the NASA IG about the importance of cost transparency for Artemis. Artemis is not just one system, it, one mission, or even one capability. Um, it's a set of increasingly complex missions and activities. Um, NASA now has successfully completed Artemis One. Could you explain how, how NASA is, is documenting the lessons that we have learned in Artemis One, such that we are applying those lessons to Artemis Two II and Three? Certainly. So we did a very extensive lessons learned process coming out of Artemis I that enabled us to, at every level within the organization and within the hardware production, whether it's at the contractor level or NASA doing integration and analysis, to be able to factor that into the Artemis II learning as well as future missions. As I indicated previously, we have, we are, we have a lot of missions in flow and in, in um, development simultaneously. What that does is it enables us to, when we learn a lesson on Artemis I, we can flow that into all of the development that we have currently ongoing. It also allows us if, for example, we've already built some equipment for Artemis II, we already have Artemis III at nearly the right level in its production to be able to make modifications to that hardware and then bring it forward to incorporate it into Artemis II, just as an example. So having the rich, I'll say, um, production cadence that we have established with our Artemis missions and our hardware has enabled us to be able to incorporate all of those lessons learned. I will also note to the comment about the cost and cost transparency. One of the challenges that we face in answering a permission cost is our contracts are set up to do bulk buys. In other words, we get if I go buy three of something, I can get it less expensive than if I buy one of something three times. So when we have established our contracts and we purchase some of our equipment, those bulk buys give us cost savings. But what those do is it lumps costs together in by program and by purchases. It doesn't allow us, we don't, for example, get appropriations for Artemis missions. I don't get an Artemis I appropriation and an Artemis II appropriation. I get one for SpaceX, excuse me, for HLS, for Orion, for the Space Launch System. So aggregating those costs where we'd make bulk buys and we make purchases based on different contract mechanisms makes it very challenging for us to put together a permission cost. But we are very transparent in the cost numbers that we have with the contract structures that we have in place and with the way that we are appropriated. 
So you would say that it is an investment. Artemis one is an investment in two, and then two is an investment. All in of these missions build on each other. Yes, sir. Great. Um, you know, humans landed on the lunar surface in 1969. In the year 2024, we still use some of the same technology um, that was developed, you know, some 55 years ago. And I like to say that we wouldn't have uh, computers in our pockets if we didn't uh, have that investment. Uh, so, Ms. Kerner, could you speak to what returning to the moon and eventually going to Mars will mean for the science and technology of tomorrow? Yeah, if, if you'll permit me an analogy. So, so I was here, by the way, and watched Apollo 11 astronauts walk on the moon. Um, so I remember that, and I remember the inspiration that that was to me and to, to those from my generation. Um, the analogy that I'll use for you is, right, a car today and a car from the early 1900s look pretty similar in some regards. They have a steering wheel, they have wheels, they transport people, any number of people depending on the design. But when you look inside the engine, they're very different. They're very different machines. The technology that we're going to the moon with this time is very different. And the technologies that we're developing are actually developing entire industries to support those technologies. Industries, craft trades, that things of that nature that are helping the economic engine of the United States as well as our partnering countries. Um, I, I lived in East Texas. Um, and I remember everything about that Saturday morning when Space Shuttle Columbia disintegrated. Um, I, I still feel it to this day. Um, next week, we will recognize NASA's Day of Remembrance to honor the heroes uh, that made that ultimate sacrifice to advance our nation's space flight and uh, exploration programs. Um, I know my time is waning. Um, how do we plan to communicate the upcoming risk um, as, as we continue to go farther? Uh, would anyone like to answer that? I would like to at least start out by doing that. So many of us lived through the tragedy of Columbia, and many of us witnessed the tragedy of Challenger as well. And those of us who are still within, within the agency take those lessons very seriously. And we make sure that, that when we have a day of remembrance, we remember not only the, the tremendous lives that these people lived and the sacrifices that they made, but we remember why we do what we do and why we are so focused on risk and on safety, which is the reason, for example, we did not hesitate to adjust the launch date for Artemis II when it became evident that safety was of utmost importance with the challenges we were facing. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Posey, for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party uh, threatens almost every component uh, of our government uh, and the lives of Americans, obviously. Uh, Ms. Kerner, your written testimony didn't mention uh, China at all. Uh, Mr. Russell, you, you mentioned diversity, but you didn't mention China. Uh, Ms. Scott didn't mention China. Uh, Dr. Griffin, your testimony does uh, mention our adversary, China, and I wonder if you would expound upon uh, why you went to such detail for the clarification of others? In my judgment, um, China, and, the, and I, I don't want to say China, I want to say the Chinese Communist Party fully understands and, and, and frequently says um, that their goal is to be the world's great power. They regard the Western democracies as decadent and outmoded and ineffective and inefficient. Um, China's uh, president, he has other titles, Xi, uh, bullies neighboring countries, uh, presumes to take control of international waterways, uh, supervises a military establishment that has recently sunk other people's ships fishing in their own waters. Everything about the behavior of the Chinese Communist Party uh, suggests that they are their adversary, and they say so. To allow a situation de to develop where the human frontier is populated by our adversary and we are not there should be unacceptable to this nation and to our uh, Western and Asian partners. It should be unacceptable. 
uh, we are not on a path to recognize that. The rest of the world looks and will always look to the nations that occupy the frontier and exploit the frontier and extend the frontier as leaders of the world. I believe that's a position that the United States should occupy uh, in preference to our adversaries. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gray. And you mentioned frontier. Uh, add to that ultimate military high ground. Whoever controls space will control the destiny of this earth. As, as you know, I've spent considerable time in the national security side of our space programs as well, and I really consider them to be one program. But uh, um, I came here today to discuss civil space, sir, and yeah. uh, we can, uh, ha we can discuss military space at another occasion. Ha how should America uh, make it our goal to ensure that we emerge as first among equals uh, when it comes to setting standards? We've had a couple of hearings on that. Well, the, the standards are set by the people who show up. They're not, they're not set by the people who watch what happens with others. So by returning to the moon in a focused and expeditious manner, which we are not today, uh, we will inevitably bring along, we will be required to bring along communications and navigation and other infrastructure systems, which we, we expect others will use as well. Uh, by that mechanism, we will have established the standards just as we did with the ICAO starting at the end of World War II for, for global air transport. But again, those, those are facts on the ground that are created by the people who are on the frontier first. They're not created by the people who follow. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Uh, Ms. Kerner, what specific steps are being taken to address what some consider to be the outdated uh, gas and propellant uh, pipelines and other ground systems at Kennedy Space Center to in ensure that we have the capacity to support our booming commercial space sector. So the infrastructure at the Kennedy Space Center, as well as at all of our centers, is very much aging, and we are aware of that within the agency. I will tell you from an Artemis perspective, we are investing heavily in the capabilities that we need to support the Artemis mission. Last year, we had over 70 launches from this uh, Florida Space Coast. It's an exciting time for all of us in the space in industry. Most of those were on the, the Cape side, but we also had a number of them from, um, from our side on the, at the Kennedy Space Center. And in order, <clears throat> excuse me, in order to support those, we have poured heavily, as I said, into the infrastructure, but we also recognize that there's still more that is needed there. Many of the launches from that area are commercial in nature, and we have um, use agreements with our commercial and industry partners that allow them to actually invest in the infrastructure as well. We know as an agency that our infrastructure is older than I am in some cases, and our NASA leadership has established what's called NASA 2040, which is an internal effort to look at all of the agency's infrastructure and mission support functions to be able to set us up properly, properly for what the agency's mission is going to be in the 2040 timeframe. Infrastructure like that at the Kennedy Space Center, which is critically important to us in Artemis, is part of that discussion. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I yield back with a uh, request that we also have a weather modification uh, technology <coughs> hearing again. Thank you. Duly noted. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the ranking member of the full committee for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, now, as I understand it, our uh, effort to go to the moon is going to rely on at least five major, distinct, multi-billion dollar development programs that have to sync up perfectly. The SLS rocket, the Orion crew vehicle, the exploration ground system, the human landing system, as well as the spacesuit. I am, uh, they're all going to be procured under different acquisition mechanisms. I particularly would like to know about the cryogenic fluid management and other new uh, technologies. What happens uh, if these five uh, major programs don't sync up or if one gets slowed down? How do we proceed? Can, can you uh, address that, uh, Mr. Kerner, Ms. Kerner? Certainly, thank you for the question. So we established the Moon to Mars program office just last year pursuant to the NASA Authorization Act 
to do just what you're talking about, to integrate all of those programs that are essential for Artemis and ensure that we are properly level loading the risk between those programs so that they all converge together for a mission. We know that it's gonna be challenging and difficult for us to, especially as we get into later missions, to get all of those missions to align to the same time frame. And so we have put our contracts in place to continue to develop hardware for the subsequent missions so that we can be ready to execute a mission as soon as all of the elements are available. We also recognize that there might be some development and technology challenges that come along the way. And so we are, have a very flexible and adaptable mission structure that allows us to be able to make updates to our mission profiles if we need to in the event that one element in the Artemis program's cadre does not make it in time for the original planned mission. Well, uh, just following up, if one of these elements is delayed, what happens to the whole program? So we would, depending on the, how long the delay is, depending on the reason for the delay, we would potentially execute a slightly modified version of that mission. And I mention that only because we have set in, pro in place for our agency a process that allows us to keep our eye on the ob exploration objectives, and all of our missions contribute to those exploration objectives. So we can modify the mission content to adjust to still accomplish those, ob those objectives. Unlike, for example, when we flew space shuttle missions, each mission was very independent and different. With Artemis, we're building a capability, not just a launch capability, but a capability in cislunar orbit, capability on the surface of the moon over time. And as any large scale development activity um, knows, when you do that, you can make adjustments for when something gets delivered late or something shows up differently. You focus then on another aspect or another objective that you're trying to achieve. Let me ask uh, this, the uh, IG issued a report in October of, of last year about uh, the uh, supply chain monitoring. What has NASA done to uh, adopt those recommendations relative to the Artemis supply chain? So we certainly do appreciate um, our, our governing organizations that provide us feedback and, and contribute to the benefit of the program. We have looked at our supply chain and supply chain management and looked at how we can better manage that. And I'll speak again to what I mentioned previously, the Moon to Mars program office, that office was deliberately established so that we can connect all of the, what were previously disparate programs and look across the board and address some of these supply chain issues. I, I wanna say I also saw uh, the landing on the moon. It was uh, a stunning thing, but I'll confess at the time I thought, how is this helping us here on Earth? Now, I listened closely to Dr. Griffin's assessment of the Chinese. I completely agree with him. Um, I do think it's important to outline for the American public why this matters to them. And I'm wondering, um, Ms. Kerner, if you can outline uh, efforts that NASA is making to explain why this matters to America. And by the way, I concur in the chairman's comment that the administrator has huge confidence in you. So if you could thank answer you. that. Uh, thank you, that's a little bit embarrassing, I'll admit. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but, um, but I'll say one of the efforts that we have done within our agency and within the last couple of years really focus on the why, the why of exploration. And we identified three pillars associated with that why. Science, national posture, and inspiration. Science, I think, is obvious. It's the engine that generates economic benefit wherever it goes, and in addition to inspiring the next generation of STEM, um, as well as teachers and those of us who look to the scientific discovery with wonder and decide that is something I wanna learn more about and wanna pursue. Additionally, national posture, I think we've spoken to that a little bit already with Dr. Griffin's testimony, but I'll state, we believe, and the, our administrators spoke about it just last week, that we will be on the surface of the moon before China is, and it's our intent for that to happen. Now, there are other government agencies that can provide a, a much more detailed briefing that um, we can do in a, in a different environment than here that can give you more insight and information about China's progress and about our progress along those lines. 
Let's see, I mentioned the, the two of the three pillars, the third one, inspiration. Again, you know, it's what inspired me to pursue a STEM career. It's what inspired many people in my generation and really developed that next generation that we're starting to see. And we hope to do that inspiration, not just here in the United States, but around the world. Well, I thank you very much. Just by the way, before I yield back, we had an astronaut come and meet with students in Hollister, California, just a few days ago, inspiring those young people. It's very important. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and yield back. The gentlelady yields back, and before I turn to my next colleague for questions, I would note, since it's true confession time, yes, I was nine years old that summer, too. <laughs> but in my part of rural Oklahoma, we had one television station, we only had AM radio, and this strange concept called party lines for a phone system. <laughs> I remember those. You know exactly how many relatives you have based on what you said on the phone. <laughs> that said, I turn to the gentleman, Mr. McCormick, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The Artemis mission is not only about returning the humans to the moon, but about advancing technology, fostering international cooperation, stimulating the economy, inspiring the public, and securing the United States position as leaders in space exploration. Similarly, in the 1960s, we were again faced with the space race, only this time with the Chinese, not just the Russians. The United States must be a leader of space, and we must lead by setting the standards we know will continue the incredible innovation and advancement we have fostered here. I have a keen understanding of the important implications of the Artemis program for our economy, national security, and advancement of technology, but do think we need to evaluate the real challenges of NASA we're facing to achieve their goal in a timely and cost-effective manner. I'm going to take a little tack away from our typical uh, questioning, get into a little bit of medicine and human physiology in space as a physician. Uh, recently, the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs and Walter Reed Army Institute of Research uh, have come together to look at a promising technology known as mitochondrial organelle transplantation. Uh, to address the mitochondria dysfunction, and neurogenerative diseases that we've seen in human beings, but also in astronauts for some reason, we don't even know why. Is NASA aware of the work that the VA, and this is an obscure question, so I understand I'm, I'm probably talking outside the normal peer purview, uh, but is NASA aware of this study between the VA and Walter Reed addressing mitochondria dysfunction, and would they be willing to work towards advancing technology to help these astronauts protect their, their energy cells, if you will? So I, you may or may not know this about me, but one of the interesting career um, path, parts of my uh, career path is that I spent five years running the Human Health and Performance Directorate at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Um, as an engineer running a health and medical organization, I found it a very fascinating, and I learned a lot of things about human physiology and how very little we actually understand about the, how the human system responds in a microgravity environment. And we today do not understand how the human system would respond in microgravity followed by partial gravity back to microgravity. <laughs> the longest duration um, crew member that we have just recently returned last year and he only spent 371 days in space. When we go to Mars, we're gonna have to spend close to 1,000 days in space. So I recognize that, um, that the human as a system is something that we need to investigate and explore further. I also know that we have done a number of studies and a number of investigations with the team that we have at the Johnson Space Center on the exact problem that you indicated. I'm not even gonna try to spell it or say it um, as you so eloquently did, because I am not a physician. But I will say that we have made great strides in understanding not only what happens to the astronauts, but what happens to the astronauts and how that can then apply to similar, um, I'll say, subjects on the ground. And, that transferring of that technology and that information has made great strides in a number of medical fields. You can find equipment um, that we use to do, to, for treating astronauts in an emergency room anywhere in the United States and around the world. So um, we do actually do partner with them and with others, and I would welcome further conversation on that and putting you in touch with some of the folks that we have that do that work on a regular basis. I think that's amazing. As a matter of fact, if you want to consider somebody who's a pilot and a physician and maybe a congressman going on one of those missions, just let me know. <laughs> I'll, I'll keep that in mind. Thank you. Dr. Griffin, uh, it's no secret that China has a goal to surpass the United States by 2045. Uh, as global leaders in space, we, we can't allow this to happen. Uh, I think the, the leading edge that we have in space technology will protect the United States in, 
not just the economy, but technologies that can benefit humankind like we just discussed. As the United States works to recruit additional international partners, how can we, the government, continue to promote its vision in space to diplomacy over China? In other words, you can see uh, countries like India putting a vehicle on the dark side of the moon for about $75 million. Now, granted, it's not manned, so it, it does cut some corners, and, and they maybe don't have the same bureaucracy uh, requirements, but how can we partner with other countries to make this a more efficient process? The way we effectively partner with other countries is to establish that we are going to do great things and that there is room for everybody of like mind to join us. Um, we can't partner with people. Um, <laughs> we can't partner with people with an empty bag. Okay, we have to be clearly seen to be doing things in an efficient, expeditious, focused, determined way. And when that happens, uh, partners will appear. Great, thanks. And I'll just uh, yield with the statement that uh, this investment is an investment in the future and has great economic and technological uh, benefit to us as we uh, continue to invest in Artemis. Thank you. I yield. Our, our gentleman yields back. Recognize my colleague, uh, Ms. Carveo, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chair Lucas and Ranking Member Sorensen for holding this hearing, um, and thank you to the witnesses for joining us today. Uh, if there's one state uh, that perhaps unexpectedly is anonymous with the Artemis mission, it's my home state of Colorado. <clears throat> Excuse me. From navigation tools associated with the mission to the Orion capsule itself, Colorado's advanced aerospace infrastructure has been pivotal in the development of these missions. I'm also proud to say that I represent many of the workers and contractors who have made Artemis possible and I'm excited to continue my support for these missions. Um, however, I think we have heard a lot of concerns here about the timeline for the Artemis missions, um, and I think something that we've kind of been beating around the bush um, about um, is overall funding um, uh, for NASA um, and whether you have um, the money to carry these missions out. Um, so uh, Associate Administrator Kerner, in particular when we hear today about uh, the pressures that you have to cut costs um, to maintain crew safety, to keep things um, on time, um, but also um, when we uh, have a Congress that has been unable to pass a budget overall, uh, what are the implications for Artemis if NASA is appropriated with flat budgets uh, beyond not just 2024, but potentially the rest of the decade? So as I mentioned earlier, we are in production on not only Artemis II, but Artemis III, Artemis IV, Artemis V. We have hardware and builds for all of those missions at various stages, right? So consistency in budget helps us be able to keep the cadence of those missions to where we can keep our team um, fresh and keep our team active and be, have them be able to actually produce the hardware in a timely fashion. We have been challenged by um, by Congress to have an annual cadence of our missions. And if we get stuck in either a flat line or a reduced budget kind of environment, what that means is we will prioritize the near-term missions. Artemis II and Artemis III will be prioritized. And those other missions in the interval between those other missions will continue to push out to the right. It would be my hope that we wouldn't be faced with that kind of a, a situation. But but that's how I, I would envision that, that playing out. I would add, though, um, resources is more than just budget in my mind. Time is also a resource, but also personnel is a resource. And one of the benefits of flying these Artemis missions is we inspire the next generation of engineers, of technicians, of welders, of people that can actually do the work, which there is a tremendous shortage of skilled labor in some areas. That is, I'm sure you know if you've talked to your, your um, for example, some of the contractors that are in your home state, they'll tell you it's sometimes challenging to find the right skill level for for building and doing the things that we're trying to do with Artemis. So consistency both in, in budget, but also the resources and the inspiration that we can provide to inspire that next individual who can help us build the generation that we're looking forward to building. Thank you so much. Those are very um, good points, and I think the consistency in budget probably has a direct implication on um, people being willing um, to, to take these jobs. So Dr. Griffin, in that same uh, kind of vein, in your experience, what can the impact of flat budgets and budgetary uncertainty for short-term CRs and shutdown threats, which we've had many of um, this uh, session, have on uh, the NASA contractor workforce and its ability to meet NASA's needs? I'm sorry. In my experience in both DOD and NASA, uh, 
multiple occasions over the years, uh, it's not so much a flat budget that is a problem. Actually, most of the time I would welcome a flat budget if I knew I was going to have it. Um, it's, uh, it needs to be at an appropriate level to accomplish the task at hand, um, but, but flatness in itself is not the issue. Um, the issue is that uh, when we do not have an appropriation on time, year after year, we force our, the government actually does very little work itself. It, it may plan and may integrate work, but the work is done by American industry and, and in some cases our partner industries. And when we cannot, when we stop and start that funding by delaying our, or, or even skipping our appropriation cycles as we did in 2008, um, that, that is a huge problem. Thank you very much. I yield back the remainder of my time. Chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Issa, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, over a decade ago, almost two decades ago now, Elon Musk began telling us here on the Capitol and around the country, anywhere someone would listen, that the United States was getting ripped off, that in fact, it shouldn't cost more and take longer to, uh, uh, to take the same basic rocket and drive the same number of pounds into space. Until he got through the almost infinite blockade by the established launch people, nothing happened. Today we are launching, and in theory we're launching for less. But I guess my, my question is, whatever happened to uh, fixed firm? And, uh, and fair, whatever happened to that? I think the question primarily for the IG is, is there any reason that these contracts, uh, particularly to go to the moon and circle it, weren't done on a tell us what it'll cost half a century after you already did it? Thank you, Mr. Issa. So we've previously reported, you know, NASA's been challenged to establish credible costs and schedule estimates. Uh, well, certainly appropriate. And they haven't met that challenge. Is that more or less correct? Uh, to date, in the way that we would say it's most transparent, that is correct. I think while it's certainly appropriate to have commercial partners involved in the launch uh, activities, a key challenge that we continue to remind the agency is important uh, to hold them accountable for delivering the promised goods and services at the promised price. Uh, you know, we've previously reported that at times, even though contractors were behind schedule and over costs, NASA was still paying them overly generous uh, performance awards. And so I think, again, this is less about like the who and more about just making sure that you hold them accountable uh, for delivering at the price they promised. Well, a follow up to that, when you've got to, I mean, because you're in the business of figuring out the why, is it because the contractors are not living up to their original promise, perhaps never intended to, or is, is portion of the blame, uh, the, the shifting sands of, of NASA starting a project and then endlessly changing it even when it's to return to do what you did half a century ago? I mean, our work has identified, identified various factors contributing to some of these challenges. You know, one is workforce challenges. Uh, it's harder, you know, while you can set a requirement, uh, if you don't have the workforce available at the time to actually execute it, that's challenging. Well, what was also, it, but, NASA's but, but change of requirements. Workforce is a great question. If I'm any of these contractors, either the historic incumbents or, or the newer uh, combinations, isn't that in the bid? There's, there's always optimism that you'll be able to get the workforce to complete the work, right? Some of these contractors are actually competing for the same workers, for example. And again, whether it's workforce issues, whether it's changing requirements on NASA's part, all of those add into uh, these eventual cost overruns that NASA experiences on some of these contracts. Again, this is about accountability for holding the vendors uh, responsible for what they're promising. Okay, well, I'm going to go back again. When you look at the current cost overruns and time delays, can you pull your slide rule out and figure out why? Or do we have to rely on computers now that cost more and take longer? Sorry, but I can't resist the fact that we truly did go to the moon with slide rules, and we now seem to be, take longer with more indecision when we're simply retracing the steps. Perhaps it's because we're not measuring with a slide rule. Our work uh, previously talked about 
some of the challenges NASA faced with project management. Part of it was over-optimism, right? NASA can get things done. Sometimes that confidence in getting things done so overrules what you know it's going to take to actually get it done. Part of it is, and Kathy spoke to this earlier, uh, the unstable funding stream. Right? It's hard to plan in the long term if you're not sure uh, about your funding stream in the near term. And finally, sort of making sure you continue to grow the workforce uh, within NASA and within the industry to continue to support the work you're doing. So there are a number of challenges uh, to, to NASA being able to get these projects done on time and at the promised amount. Well, if we assume for a moment that Congress isn't going to change, we assume for a moment that the moon isn't moving differently than it did half a century ago, what should we demand that NASA do in order to deliver the rest of Artemis, Artemis two and three on time and with no greater overruns than we've already experienced? What would be the steps that Congress would be required to take? In my view, one would be locking the agency down into making uh, life cycle costs and schedule commitments. Uh, we understand that the world is complex, things will change, but it's incredibly important for Congress to at least have an initial idea of what this is going to cost and when NASA can get it done. I thank you. I, the questions could go on uh, again and again, but I probably really would have to bring a slide rule if I were going to calculate all the overruns. So with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. It would be fascinating watching you use a slide ruler. <laughs> I've got a whole bunch in my collection if you want me to not bring them in. Not a doubt in my mind, not a doubt at all in my mind. The chair now recognizes the uh, Congresswoman Lee for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member for holding this important meeting. Uh, serving in this office for over a year now has been a unique experience learning more about the scientific communities and the ways I can serve my constituents beyond the personal passions that drove me uh, to serve in Western Pennsylvania. Recent inclement weather across the country has affected us all in one way or another, but space science, particularly through the use of satellites, is crucial for meteorolog meteorologists like yourself, Mr. Sorensen, to make more accurate and timely weather predictions, ultimately improving our ability to respond to and mitigate the impact of various weather events. While we continue to race to the moon and all the discoveries that we may uncover there, I continue to look towards the research and work of countless scientists here on Earth and thousand miles above. Uh, that will help innovate our approach towards realizing things like cleaner air and water, sustainable infrastructure, and more equitable transportation in Southwest PA and across the nation. Today we've discussed what path forward entails in returning men and hopefully landing our first woman on the moon. In this arena, just as in life, the concept of failure is an essential step in the pathway to success. I'm proud to represent Astrobotic in Pittsburgh, who for the last 16 years has worked tirelessly to make returning Americans to the moon's surface a reality. While last week's unfortunate anomaly with the Peregrine lunar landing reaffirms the unforgiving nature of the space environment, it also further highlights that success uh, the success that we can achieve through the pursuit of innovation and pushing boundaries. Between the lander's launch and its expected re-entry uh, to Earth's atmosphere tomorrow, the vehicle's flight has provided irre irreplaceable knowledge, experience, and insight that will feed forward into making Artemis and the U.S. return to the moon a sustained success. Onboard flight systems like avionics, propulsion controllers, thermal control systems, and more have been tested and qualified, uh, creating new capability in the U.S. space industrial base uh, that could be utilized for other missions and programs in the future. So I'd say now is not the time to retreat. Our nation has consistently throughout its history built upon our ability to adapt and respond to failures. And mu we must continue to support CLPS efforts so the nation gets the benefit of hard earned lessons learned from the missions of that mission and others like it. Um, Ms. Carner, while setbacks are often inevitable in science and in life, commercial space industry leaders like Astrobotic find a measurable, a measurable value and constancy of purpose in programs critical to the Artemis mission. Why is it critical for the nation to keep supporting missions like those on uh, commercial lunar payload services despite the challenges? So part of our charter is also to develop an econ um, economic engine that generates and stimulates activity in the space sector. And so what we have been doing with the com commercial lunar payloads um, services contract, we call it CLPS, I think you refer to it as C CLPS. Oh, I like um, CLPS. CLPS. I'll do that one next. CLPS is the, is the way we refer to that, um, is one of those opportunities to help um, 
spur on the development of new space entrants. We know that there's a lot of, of space industry in, in the big names that have been out there for years, and they do contribute tremendously to the Artemis program. But we want to also make the, the, the entrance bar lower so that we can more broadly generate economic activity across the board. Plus, we find a lot more innovation in some of, <clears throat> in some of these commercial providers. Um, it was disappointing that, that the CLIPS provider had challenges last week, but we did still get tremendous data. And we'll, we will continue to get data from CLIPS missions as we launch those as per precursors. It's really important for us to have robotic precursor missions because that gives us data that mm -hmm. helps inform and enable, and it makes our, our mission safer. What we discovered and what they learned very very much so last week, but what we have discovered over a number of tragedies is that space and space exploration is unforgiving. <laughs> and what we are doing with Artemis is infinitely safer than what we did in the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo days. If, in just recently talking to one of the first um, flight directors from that era, he told me that he didn't realize until more recently just how close they were to having a, t a national tragedy during a number of those Apollo missions. And that's because they were just young and they didn't understand what they didn't know. We're a lot smarter now with the missions that we've flown and with the sacrifices that we've made. And so every step that we make with Artemis makes us safer as we explore. Thank you. Uh, that's my time. So I will yield back now instead of launching into another question. But I appreciate you all for uh, coming today and for sharing uh, your testimony. Gentlelady yields back. I would uh, note to the witnesses that we're still 40 minutes away from noon, and after consultation with the ranking member, I believe we'll do another round. Conscious of your time. Associate Director, let's go back for a moment to that uh, measure contractor performance discussion. You talked about the incentives if contractors produce uh, ahead of schedule uh, on time, and I, I think the carrot is always very important. Let's discuss for just a moment the stick. What are the consequences for contractors if they don't meet the milestones by the assigned deadline? So it, again, it depends on the type of contract, right, that we have. Um, when we have performance awards that we can decrement as associated with me not meeting milestones. For firm fixed price contracts, it depends, again, on the way the contract's written. Um, they ha they have to perf perform, and in some cases, we have penalties if they perform. They have to reimburse the U.S. government for the cost. Um, and by reimburse, I say it basically decrements the, the payment that they would get in that milestone payment. So they may not, for example, if, get all of the, a milestone payment if they don't meet in, in a timely fashion. So again, it depends on the contract mechanism, what penalties that we can put in place, but we also have ways that we can reflect the contractor performance in a global, more broad scale to the rest of the community. So it does affect their ultimate bottom line. So speaking of the milestones, uh, for instance, have any of the milestones been divided up into interim milestones or have interim milestones been created to allow for earlier payments? Uh, I ask because this data would be helpful in providing insight uh, into program progress. So um, I'm, I'm not entirely sure I understand the question. We do break certain milestones up. And for example, I, I, and I can speak to the experience I had managing the commercial resupply services contract for the International Space Station years ago. Um, if we got to a milestone and we felt like the contractor didn't do all of the things or completely meet the milestone in a timely fashion, we would withhold a certain amount of that award. That's what I mean by decrement. So instead of them getting X, they would get X minus a certain amount. Um, and we did that based, again, on the value judgment for what that milestone was worth. And then they had an opportunity in some cases, not in all, some cases that was just money that came back to the program. But in some cases, we would defer the payment until they accomplished it in the manner in which we needed. And there were plenty of opportunities that we got from them and, and I'll say, um, in-kind work and additional work and benefit to the U.S. government that was performed as a result of them, for example, being late on some of those milestones. Because I think sometimes we get questions from appropriators and other oversight entities that perhaps the milestones should be, of course, should be designed to accomplish the work in an efficient and effective fashion and accelerative helpful. 
but that the milestones not not uh, be designed just to help the contractor move along. Through no, they the process. certainly they certainly are designed. I, I'd say mutually. So when a lot of times when we award these, especially the firm fixed price contracts, the contractor pro, um, will propose to the U.S. government what they would like to see in the milestones. And as part of the negotiation before we even award that contract, we will adjust those milestones, both the values, but the timing of them also, in order to make sure that it meets the timeline that we need for whatever it is that that contractor is providing. Speaking of the international element, all these efforts, uh, again to you, Associate Director, NASA recently announced a partnership with the UAE on Gateway, under which the Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center would provide Gateway's crew and science airlock module as well as a UAE astronaut to fly to the Lunar Space Station on a future Artemis flight. How will NASA and UAE share costs related to this partnership? Uh, so I, I don't know that we, I would say we share costs, right? So when we, and when we negotiate with an international partner for a contribution to Artemis or to any activity, there is a, a, I'll say, a value that we assess, that we, the U.S. government, assess on, the, on what they are contributing. And then in kind, we return a value to them. So for example, the one that you mentioned, they, the UAE will be providing the airlock. And in exchange, we, NASA, are going to be training a crew member for, and launching a crew member and giving that country an opportunity to have a crew member on the Gateway Space Station. So it's more of a value-to-value value contribution as opposed to a, a cost. By the way, is the uh, UAE-provided airlock on the Gateway a critical path, an important it part absolutely, of the concept? It absolutely is critical. So it enables us to, to have access to both um, internal as well as now external access to scientific payloads that we could put on the exterior of Gateway, and it enables us to be able to do maintenance on the Gateway. Having an airlock provides a, a more flexibility for how we use the, the Gateway space station in cislunar orbit for future missions. I spoke to it earlier when I talked about the flexibility in our, in our missions. Having different elements of the Artemis program enables us to have that mission flexibility. Ranking member, humor me for one more question. The UAE is, of course, an example of international partnership. They have resources with which to work, which is critically important. But I ask this question in the context of the technology. They also have a history of partnering with China in lunar efforts. Uh, for instance, the same entity has an agreement to include a rover on the Chinese mission to the lunar south pole. I guess my question is how, when we are partnering with people who are partnering with others, how do we ensure that the technology shared through a partnership doesn't, uh, shall we say, inadvertently contribute to someone else's space uh, capacities? So we have a fairly rigorous export control process that monitors and, and manages our interactions with our international partners at every level to ensure that exactly what you just said does not happen. Uh, my time has expired. I recognize gentlemen, Mr. Sorensen for five more minutes. Um, I, in my opening statements, I had mentioned how important it was to bring a NASA astronaut to my district. Uh, Dr. Kate Rubens has been back and forth to the International Space Station several times. And one of the simple problems that she discussed uh, with me and with the students in my district as we were going to schools was that spacesuits were designed for men. They weren't designed for women. And, and that was something that, that she had to deal with in real time. Um, and so that brings me to another line of questioning uh, and for Mr. Russell. Uh, GAO's recent report on Artemis programs noted challenges with developing and testing the exploration spacesuit. Can you discuss these challenges and what measures can NASA take to help address such challenges, including issues that we have with the supply chain? Certainly, thank you for the question. I, I think the first challenge to note was originally NASA designed the space suit in-house and then made the decision to uh, contract that out, um, which, which is happening now. As we, as we took a look at some of the, the current challenges, certainly one has to do with uh, sufficient life support. Um, you need to have backup as you're doing lunar operations, have confidence that uh, the system can operate and, and sustain the astronauts' uh, life uh, as they go through the mission. So 
there are some technologies that need to be matured there, um, some refinements to the, the requirements that the contractor is working on. That's th some of the key things that we pointed to in our, our recent report. Uh, Ms. Kerner, I'd, I'd like to go a little bit more in depth on that. Um, could you talk about the significant work that is needed to mature technologies for the exploration spacesuit life support systems, as Mr. Russell was talking about? Are, are the spacesuits on the critical path for Artemis III? Uh, does, does NASA have the roadmap for how spacesuit uh, life support systems will be matured and, and then maintained? So as was noted, NASA designed the spacesuit and gave this, made that design available to U.S. industry to be able to produce. And one of our spacesuit providers is using that design. We have a long history of, um, of doing space walks and developing spacesuits, but also managing spacesuits and managing those systems. I, I think it's obvious, but I, I just want to make sure it's very, I state it very clearly. A spacesuit uh, is like a personal spacecraft. And it's very complex. It has all of the same kinds of systems that a, a spacecraft would have, but in a much smaller um, environment. And it has to be, as you noted, adaptable for um, both male and female of various sizes and shapes. Um, so the design and the development of the hardware for that is something that while NASA has experience on, we're trying to foster that experience in our commercial industry partners and are helping them. One of the ways we do that is through government task agreements, and we are enabling their development and, and helping them with some of that testing through those government task agreements. So it really is a partnership activity, even though it is a service contract, and they are doing the, the, the development of the exploration suit, NASA is standing side by side with them and enabling that to happen. Do you, and I'll open this to, to anyone who wants to answer. Are there, are there other opportunities for public-private partnership that we haven't yet done yet? For instance, with spacesuits, to open that up uh, to, to companies to be able to come up with the technology to learn. Are there other ways, as we look forward to Artemis II and Artemis III, um, that we can look forward to that? So I'll offer that um, there's plenty of opportunity, I would say, for partnerships and for on ramping new technologies, not just in spacesuits, but in every aspect of what we're doing with Artemis. One of the things that we've done over the last couple of years is we established a process for our architecture, which is the entirety of our plan for exploration, um, that does an annual review where our entire organization, all of NASA, all of our mission directorates, all of our technical authorities, all of our centers, all get to weigh in on the path that NASA is, is moving forward on. And we get to share the technologies that are developed in industry and on-ramp those. We share the output from that review with industry, and we have a constant and regular dialogue with industry, with our international partners, with academia, to do just that, to identify opportunities for partnerships, but also to make sure that what we're doing with our exploration activities aligns with the direction that our stakeholders want us to go. Right, so we're on the right path for Artemis. II. I believe we are. Thank you. I would, add, if I might add. Yes, sir. I, I would add that if the United States and its international partners have a consistent program to return to the moon and stay, that there are an enormous number of infrastructure development um, opportunities available in which commercial industry can invest because they know that there will be a return. So I mentioned communications, navigation, uh, functions earlier, command and data handling, data storage. Uh, the CLIPS program was brought up. Uh, there will be a need in, in supplying a human lunar base for all types of cargo, ranging from small high-value items to bulk cargo uh, that uh, industry could supply if they know that there is going to be a consistent market for such. And I think that's an important part, is we're not just going back to the moon, we're going back to the moon to stay on the moon. I, I would hope so, although I've been trying for over 30 years to promote such an activity and have so far failed, so I possibly should retire from the field. <laughs> no, don't do that. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. You never give up. Speaking of never giving up, I recognize the gentleman from California for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Associate Director, you, uh, you talked about reducing uh, the mortality or potential mortality. Uh, we've, uh, we've lost 15 astronauts over the years. 
I guess, I guess my question is, what statistic or fact would show that we've become safer over time in space? So I don't know that I could point to a single statistic, but what I will tell you is that we have more redundancy in our systems, we have more reliability in our systems, we have more capability in our systems, and I think that alone gives us a greater confidence that even though we're doing something that is extremely, as I said earlier, unforgiving, that we have more safeguards and safety in the system. Well, I understand, but today we're, talk we're looking at significant delays in doing something that we did before. Uh, nobody died going to the moon and back. Uh, as a matter of fact, the, uh, the program that killed most of our astronauts uh, was the cost-saving, redundant use, new and improved shuttle. Uh, ultimately, that program killed the, the majority of all astronauts that ever died. The early exploration had its, uh, its death, including three on the ground. Um, we learned from that, uh, don't sit in a bag of oxygen uh, on the ground, not able to uh, get off the ship quickly. So there, there have been lessons, but I'm, you know, I've listened for quite a while to this discussion about the, the space suit and, and you know, what we're going to do, and the discussion as though that women were new to space. Uh, I'm sorry, but we've, we've had women in space uh, for longer than some members of Congress have lived now. So um, I, I, I'll ask again, uh, we're looking at overruns and delays. And so I think I'll go to uh, Mr. Russell. Um, when, when they're uh, putting that figure out there, we ha we've had 2.9% of all those who have gone to space have died. So it's not an insignificant number, but if you take away two events of a single program type, you suddenly go from nearly 700 flights uh, and 19 dead to almost nobody in the rest of those flights. So when we're looking at, at the cost and delivery, uh, are we in fact looking at Artemis looking for new solutions to things which have already been solved? You know, I'm. I'm from the generation of the joke about the difference between our uh, inverted uh, writing instrument and the Russians, right. okay? And, and for those who haven't seen it, exactly. We came up with the space pen, cost millions, they came up with a pencil, and for redundancy, they had a second one. So again, as we're looking at firm fixed pricing and predictability of time, should we, in fact, push NASA to accomplish the mission with the highest level of reuse of technology, or should we allow them to continue to say, but we're exploring all kinds of new technology, which inherently brings in, uh, at least in my uh, uh, examination, it brings in risk assessment of new technology. One only needs to look at the Boeing Max and ask the question, is there anything that new about a 737 going 34,000 feet? No, but somehow every change is a variable. So uh, if we're looking to deliver on time, on budget, are we doing all the right things or are we doing all the things that have, have led us to this inevitable delay and cost overrun? Great question. I think that's the, as I see it, NASA's at an inflection point right now because they are about to set the agency baseline commitments for a number of these efforts. And you referred to the firm fixed price contracts and things. And once you settle on a number, that is great. You can hold the contractor to that, that price, that uh, deliverable. But it's up to the government to have stable requirements, right? When you change those requirements, then that, that changes the deal that you have with the contractor that could cost additional funds. So. Right now, what we expect to see really then contract changes are where all the profit is, aren't? Isn't it? right? That that equals dollars. Uh, if it's a cost plus contract, you know, if there's a delay, you're paying the contractor's cost plus whatever fee uh, goes along with that. So I think as we look to these new efforts, how those technical and cost baselines are set and the realism of those are going to be very important, and we'll see in the the coming twelve to eighteen months whether the projects can adhere to those baselines, meet the technical challenges, 
There's going to be some margin for cost and schedule reserves to deal with issues, but um, the the fidelity and the the realism of those baselines will be extremely important for what are um, some new and novel technologies. It, a lot of these systems, uh, you know, it, it's not just a rocket. It it has a payload that's never been done before. There's a lot of firsts. Um, the way that the HLS system will work with a you know, essentially a gas station in space that will, um, you know, fill up the, the lander and help accomplish the mission. All of those are, are new and novel things. Um, so capturing that technical risk, putting it in a realistic baseline, I think will be essential. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield back. Gentleman yields back. Seeing no additional questions. Uh, I want to thank the witnesses for their valuable testimony and the members for your questions. Uh, we will have more of these hearings and expect, with a different attitude from Mother Nature, a really big crowd. The record will remain open for 10 days for additional comments and written questions from the members. This hearing is adjourned. <laughs>